the fight is yours. <laughs> thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And thank you very much for having me here. Uh, uh, first, we'll talk about how I think mathematics emerged actually as one of the key technologies of this um, century. Uh, with a quick historical look back, then I will talk about mathematical modeling, simulation and optimization as this mathematical technology and uh, describe various optimization problems uh, that appear in the life cycle of model. And then I walk you through a number of, I think seven or eight, mostly industrial applications through three areas of <coughs> optimization problems connected with differential equations, parameter estimation, optimum experimental design, and optimal control, and then there is something like an outlook. Okay, so <clears throat> how mathematics emerged as a key technology for the 21st century. That's a pretty buzzword-like statement, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm really convinced that this is true. So if we look back, then mathematics, we know that mathematics has been around for centuries, um, and um, David Hilbert, for instance, said um, already in the 1930s that the role of mathematics is that it is the instrument that mediates between theory and practice, between reasoning and observation, it builds the connecting bridges and is constantly enhancing their capabilities, which is what it is still today. <clears throat> but then 53 years later, a chemist, the vice president for research of the American company Exxon, said, E.E. E. David said that too few, people, uh, too few people realize that the high technology so celebrated today is really a mathematical technology. So that's the first instant where I saw that mathematics was actually called a technology. <clears throat> and if we go 10 years later, then another chemist, and so it's a say unbiased witness, not a mathematician, again, the vice president of research of BASF, the largest chemical company in the world, uh, Hans-Joachim quadbeck Zeger said that mathematical optimization has developed into an attractive instrument for industrial practice. It offers new opportunities to optimize particularly complex processes subject to numerous constraints, completely new insights are gained, and is that this allows us to advance from a trial and error from trial and error to a strategical approach. We need this to remain competitive. Spoken from the, <coughs> the point of view of somebody uh, in industry business. So then the question is what really turned mathematics that has been around for centuries, what turned it into a technology? So <coughs> truly one of the turning points was the development of uh, programmable computers. Uh, that came up from the 1940s. Here I show you a, a, a picture, a photograph of the Konrad Zuse, a German engineer, uh, the Z3 uh, from 1941, which was a remarkable um, computer because it already had a floating, it was programmable and it had a floating point, uh, arithmetic even. However, it was not based on transistors. And it didn't have a future either. <clears throat> but it's a, uh, probably the first computer uh, with such capabilities. Um, and then, of course, we had in the 50s very striking developments uh, from the first launches of satellites to the first manned space flights, uh, Yuri Gagarin, John Glenn, um, then to the moon landings of Luna and Apollo 11 and finally interplanetary probes. Um, and though I think that the f some of the first, the planning of the first such missions was actually done by desk calculators, or by hand even. But the later plans for like stellar mission, uh, interplanetary missions, or even the, the uh, missions to the moon was definitely already done on computers. But the real turning point, so more pictures. Luna and I, Sputnik, of course, the pioneer, and uh, the Apollo 11 mission. But the real uh, kickoff point for the development then came in the 60s because that was the first time that we really had 
uh, high-level languages in which we could program mathematical methods that some, at, some, at some point have been developed over the last 200, 300 years, really. But now we could put them into a program and develop programs which are really versatile. So from then on, it really began. <coughs> so we had uh, Fortran, Algol. Actually, Fortran and Algol were already designed in the 50s, but they came up only in the 60s because they became available. <coughs> so that's really the starting point of what is now called mathematical modeling simulation and optimization. And this is really introductory, not only just for the seniors, but also those who have just barely begun with mathematics. So with mathematical modeling, we mean to the translation of all the knowledge that we have, physical knowledge, hypotheses, and so on about a process, into mathematical equations that describe the development of a process in space and time. Then simulation uh, is the numerical solution of such um, equations in order to actually mimic or reproduce a process um, by, I would like to say, powerful methods of numerical mathematics. And if we really have large-scale or very complex problems, we will need, um, we need, we will need um, uh, high-performance computers. But high performance doesn't always mean that we do have to have a huge machine with lots of professor, uh, processors. It can also mean that we have a very small chip with, f uh, with very few capabilities uh, and can still solve real problems in real time. So, then, and of course, of, then this is of course my favorite because I love optimization and that's then sophisticated algorithms to compute the decision variables, to compute controls and so on, in order to optimize the performance of a process. Um, so, um, one thing that we experience over the last decades is that the problems become always more complex. And there are always the problems and the questions that people ask are always a little bit more complex than the methods are actually capable of solving. So, <clears throat> there's a constant need for new mathematical research. Um, oops. Ah, this, I, this, well, forget it. This is just uh, an example. It was just an example of, um, of an equation, but you know what equations are. So, um, so a little bit of philosophy, what MSO uh, today is it's a cross-sectional area. It's not just mathematics or applied mathematics. It also incorporates elements of engineering and of computer science. And usually it's called the third pillar of scientific research. So because it's a complementary to on the, the theory on the one hand and the experiment of, on the other hand, and it's actually a bridge between the two. And you will see this because we will use both experimental data and theory and use it for MSO. So, in industry, today it's considered an enabling technology because it makes things pop, uh, possible, but it's also really a key technology or key enabling te technology because in many areas of industries, this is really the key for a successful solution. And I'll give you some examples. <clears throat> and in many areas, Modeling and simulation and optimization uh, is absolutely needed today from physics, chemistry, engineering, economics, uh, recent, more recently, last two decades, I would say, the biosciences. But there are also new frontiers that have not been very much explored. Medicine and public health is such an area. Um, agriculture, um, only starting. And even the humanities and the cultural sciences are now interested in mathematical methods of MSO for their problems, like in archaeology, just as an example. So, <clears throat> now the question is, why did Quadbeck Seger say, we need this and with this he meant mathematical optimization as this strategical approach, why does he need it to be competitive? So the question is, what, what does, where does optimization actually make the difference? And uh, I will just now uh, talk a little bit about three types of optimization problems when we model, and then go into a more details uh, of model-based optimization with applications. So, 
first of all, so I said experiment, we want to bridge experiment and we want to, uh, in theory, so, but everything starts with the real process, with observations and speculations about the real process, we'll have data, experimental data, we will try to put into equations, that's the mathematical model. And these equations, and at least those equations that we are treating here, are not easy to solve. So, <clears throat> we come to the next step then. Uh, no, here first this is examples of models. So, this is really partially very elementary here. Um, um, so, from partial differential equations, like for diffusion and transport, to um, reduce to uh, models for functional differential equations, very often modeling reduced models for, for transports, like maturation times of erythrocytes in the stem cell compartment, um, and, uh, or ordinary differential equations and differential algebraic equations, which will be the main focus of this presentation here that I have. So we have, I, I explain this a little more detail. So what we talk about is differential algebraic equations. So we have something which is an ordinary differential equation up there. Why are the differential states? Um, and then we also have algebraic states Z and we assume that they are determined, because I restrict myself to index one systems here, they are determined by this equation. <clears throat> so we have states Y and Z. Um, P are possibly unknown uh, system parameters that we need to estimate. Every equation has unknown coefficients. Um, then there are Q are the control parameters, parameters, uh, parameters that we can choose. Uh, as well as control functions uh, abbreviated with U. These two play a big role in not only optimal control, but also in optimal experimental design. And with this class of problems, we can cover mostly everything from ordinary to certain types of non-stationary PDE, like uh, parabolic problems, for instance. And the typical complexity we find in practice are very nonlinear dynamics, we may have state-dependent discontinuities, discontinuous processes, um, and they may be either stiff or unstable or both. Okay, now what we do with this mathematical modeling what we'll, is just what, on the one hand we want to create insight into the process and we want to simulate with these differential equations, simulate various um, scenarios. <clears throat> and in order to do that, we really have to um, come up with simulation. Hmm. There is a slide missing. There should be what? <clears throat> we, do, we do have to do simulation. Anyway, so some people also call simulation the computer experiment or computer experiments. And uh, such model-based simulation is very important for testing hypotheses that we have when we formulate these model equations. Um, but very often, they are also the only chance that we have. So it's really, simulation is the only possibility which makes simulation indispensable. So <clears throat> one is quite clearly that the real experiment would be too dangerous um, or it would be at least unethical, so you wouldn't really try to simulate the meltdown of a nuclear power plant in practice. In order to study it, you rather try to simulate that on the computer. Also, it would also be unethical to um, test, um, and sometimes it is done, but it is un unethical, to, to test new medications on real people. Uh, if you don't really know what happens. And very often it's done in a very trivial way, like last year, was it? No, two years ago, in France they tested a certain medication uh, simply in order to find out the right, right dose with uh, 12 volunteers. And they were just every day doubling the doses, seeing what happens. One person died and three have had uh, permanent brain damage. Unethical. So, <clears throat> better to actually do that in a very systematic way, so there's a there's work for mathematicians to interfere and 
and do. Or it may take too long. Like agricultural experiments um, are very often taken on the computer because agricultural experiments would take a year or two, so at least one season uh, or more, so that's one of the problems. Um, or the study of long-term environmental fate of pesticides or herbicides in the ground um, is also subject to um, simulation and even enters the law by now. So it's uh, in certain countries it's actually um, necessary uh, before you get an admission for a certain pesticide or herbicide to do simulations for different grounds, for different soils. <coughs> simulations on the computer. Um, and then, of course, there are these examples where <coughs> things are completely inaccessible, as in astrophysics, and here is my example. <coughs> this is um, a computer experiment that goes on for three, 300 million years. It's a simulation of two colliding galaxies. It's a video produced in the group of uh, a colleague of mine at IWR, Volker Springer. So, um, of course, it would, on the one hand, it would be impossible to simulate a, a collision of galaxies um, because of the pure volume, but also because of the time it takes. So, 200 million years probably exceeds the lifespan of all mankind. So, <clears throat> but now we come to the kind of the, the king discipline, namely process optimization and optimal control. So the idea that people in industry call it the rational or strategical approach, that's, I'm sorry, that's a word uh, used by uh, people in industry at BSF, and the idea is by means of the simulation model that you do have um, use optimization methods directly to develop um, a process design, a, a plant design, or the optimal control strategies. Uh, rather than do um, uh, the use as in the, uh, in the past, use heuristics or trial and error, uh, and preferably even on the real process, because it takes ages and is never optimal. But if you want to do that, the most important part is you need validated and calibrated models for your process that uh, reproduce the process not only qualitatively but also quantitatively correct. So model validation is the first step if you want to do this. And in some areas you can actually come up with good data for your models but in many areas you have so many coefficients that you cannot really estimate uh, so you have to do parameter estimation. And if you do parameter estimation, you will usually find out that the fit doesn't look so good, as good as, as on this picture. Or you find out by analysis, I'll give you an example, that the good looking fit doesn't mean anything because you still haven't validated your problem. And what you then need to do is, I'm sorry, what you need to do, you have to revise your model or, and or you have to come up with new and maybe more in, um, with data which contain more information about the process. And here optimum experimental design can help you and that is the second subject of optimization that I will um, talk in a few minutes about. Okay, now we go to model-based optimization and applications. Uh, let's start with parameter estimation problems. So parameter estimation means given some measurements, so data eta ij, which are measurements of some functions that we have modeled, um, and we assume there is measurement errors, these epsilon ij's, we have to solve an approximation problem. So we have to determine the solution of our model and parameters p that minimize some deviation between measurements in a suitable norm. Subject to, um, to the fact that the um, equations should be satisfied and additional equality and inequality constraints also um, should be satisfied, like validity of, uh, that limit the validity of the model. And in my case here, <coughs> I'm uh, concentrating on uh, generalized Gauss-Newton methods, this is Gauss, 
on, on money that doesn't exist anymore, and on uh, the multiple shooting method. Okay, so um, the choice of norms is still important. Normally people would use, um, because of uh, usual statistical assumptions, they would assume that you would have normally distributed uh, methods and you would actually know the variances and then you would use something like a weighted um, least squares norm as introduced by Legendre and Gauss. Um, but much should be said because it's even much earlier than, than the two, two here, the two giants there. Uh, Boscovich, um, a Slovenian, uh, introduced L1 estimation already um, 50 years earlier than that. Um, Laplace came also up with this in, in the early 19th century. This has um, a big advantage, this is Boscovich, has a big advantage um, because it's robust against outliers, and outliers unfortunately happen very often. There is of course also a hybrid approach between L1 and L2, like the Huber um, distance measures. Okay, now first industry application, that's a project with ESA. <coughs> One unfortunate problem that happens very often, and this here is from a quote from a from Spaceflight Now 2002, uh, one of the ESA problems, the Ariane 5 launcher had propelled the Artemis satellite into a transfer orbit that was lower than expected, and the apogee was only 17,000, uh, uh, and not the expected 36,000 for uh, starting a geostationary orbit. So, and the problem, however, is if you have such a faulty launch, you need very quickly identify the, or the actual orbit and then maybe if there's enough uh, there's usually some, some fuel on board of such a satellite um, in order to correct uh, the, the, the orbit and uh, possibly place it into a geostationary orbit. Um, typical example here, what you can lose only um, four years ago in summer uh, ESA started the two, two of the Galileo satellites, that's the EU, um, uh, 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 um, that the European Union started this as, a, as its own geo, uh, geo, how do you say, GPS, geo positioning system. And I think Russia has its own, also in development. <coughs> well, just not, I'm not talking about the the launcher, just the two satellites, cost 89 million euros. Just the two satellites. So if they are lost, you lose 89 million euros. Okay. Now ESA had its own <coughs> problem. They had made their own um, estimation procedure, except that it didn't work very well, and it took them about a day to make it work with a lot of manual tuning and so on. Uh, a Levenberg Marquardt procedure, but it's not a trivial problem here, uh, so it didn't converge well. So, um, so, so they came up, to, came to us, and this is the situation that we then studied. That was the Artemis mission, because we wanted to have real data. So the model that we have is just satellite dynamics, but very detailed uh, Kepler equations, because they include this perturbation term there includes things like air drag, solar light pressure, gravity of Sun, Moon, Jupiter, the asymmetry of Earth, and so on, is all in the, in the model. So the trivial part is the Kepler part here in front. <coughs> and what we get as data are from two ground stations, from Malindi and from Perth. We get either angles or we get range, the range, the distances and, and range rates, but not both at the same time. <clears throat> so we never have the full position uh, measured. And we, what we need to determine is position and velocity at a certain point of time uh, in order to identify what the orbit is and possibly other parameters like uh, um, if, you, if this is really a low orbit then maybe additionally um, atmosphere parameters, say. So, <clears throat> Uh, so, but the problem is we have few data only, and we want to have it within the first 
half of the orbit, like within half or half an hour or 60 minutes. And the problem is only few measurements. In our case, during the first hour, we only have eight range measurements, and three times we have the polar angles. That's all. During the first hour. Not much. <clears throat> and so new algorithms were needed, and so we had to develop new robust L1 and hybrid Gauss Newton methods, new globalization and new initialization strategies based on direct multiple shooting, or direct, I'm sorry, direct multiple shooting. And I, I will briefly explain what multiple shooting is in a minute. So, here you can actually see the outliers. <clears throat> These are kind of artificial outliers because both the data and the simulation um, take ang angular data modulo 2 pi. <clears throat> However, if the data and the simulation during the optimization are not totally synchronous, that's a serious discontinuity in the system that makes the optimization fail. <clears throat> and here you see the performance of these new methods. So the new version that we have developed, in particular uh, Ekaterina Kostya now was uh, responsible for that, performs much, much better than the original versions of, um, that were developed and available at the ESA. And you see also between the L1 solution and the L2 solution, there is almost no difference. They coincide <coughs> in the important parts, they coincide to more than five decimals. So here that's the, uh, how, how the initial trajectory is actually generated. And um, um, you see the red, the red line is the nominal orbit that was used as a starting strategy. And there was a multiple shooting initialization by back projection. So whenever, if you see a flashing ball, then you get a distance. Whenever you see a ray, then you get two angles. And they are used to actually initialize the trajectory such that you get your convergence no matter how within a few iterations. So it was a new idea. This is the solution. This was uh, the method works. It was actually used in the case of Galileo. And they were using the old method and didn't get a solution within a day. And then they were using our method and they get, got their solution uh, within a minute. I mean, computing time, just a few seconds, really. <clears throat> so, um, now I said multiple shooting. What is multiple shooting? Well, this is the workhorse of my group. That's how we solve boundary value problems and optimization problems connected with differential equations. And the idea is, well, the classical, in the, this is just the example of um, um, parameter estimation. So what you would classically do you would guess some parameter, integrate over the whole interval, determine the distance from the measurements, so you have your function that you want to minimize, generate gradients, and iterate. Okay? So, but what you do, if you do that, you eliminate the state variables by solving the differential equation, so it's just an optimization problem with respect to the unknown parameters. But optimization problems and their solution always depends on your, their initial state. But you don't know the parameters, but you do have an idea what the state is. So you're given up important information. So multiple shooting is different. You discretize your uh, differential equation, and then you solve simultaneously the optimization problem, the discretized differential equation, plus further constraints that you have in one loop. So in here is a picture uh, first. So you choose, a, in multiple shooting, you choose a suitable mesh uh, for the, your discretization. You introduce the state variables as additional optimization parameters. That's the basis of the code um, PAFIT. And then you integrate your differential equation only over subintervals, which you can also do in parallel if necessary. Uh, but then, of course, what you need to do is you need that these jumps here, they need to vanish at the solution. So you have a constraint optimization problem. But the solution is equivalent to um, doing an integration over the whole interval. This is multiple shooting. 
And uh, this is also, but the, in case you really have an algebraic constraint, you can also relax the algebraic constraint, and the relaxation, of course, then has to vanish. So that's the, the setup, and what you end up having is a um, equality and inequality constraint um, approximation problem. And the equality constraints um, contain the discretized uh, differential equation system. You can, of course, also use finite differences. Multiple shooting is only one way. <coughs> and the, this you solve, as usual, iteratively with Newton-type methods. And in each step, then, you have to solve a linearized approximation problem with linearized constraints. That's the Gauss-Newton-type Gauss method. And, uh, and the linear system, and this is just a slide because I need this uh, in a moment, such a linear system here can be solved by a generalized inverse. Of course, linear systems don't have a, an inverse of check the Jacobian still one J2 as a solution, but they do have a generalized or outer inverse that satisfies this equation down here. <coughs> but it is a matrix that you can actually compute and that plays an important role. So <clears throat> this method, what we know is where you have usually good linear, linear, locally linear convergence, depending on how good your measurements are and, or how good, how good measurement fits with the model. And uh, so the rate, the asymptotic rate depends on the size of the residual at the solution. And with step size control, you can prove it's globally convergent. Um, <clears throat> well, of course, there is the question, why make it so difficult? Because you do get such systems here, linear systems, and you have to exploit the structure uh, for efficiency, because you get, of course, many more variables than before. <clears throat> but what you do, what you get as an advantage is you get much better global convergence behavior, you get much improved local convergence, and the system is numerically stable, even for highly unstable systems. That's one of the advantages. So you can solve parameter estimation for chaotic systems this way, for instance. And, uh, and there are other advantages that I would skip. Um, here is a cute, very old test problem, very unstable. So these are our model equations. And uh, for the true parameter value, which is pi, p equal pi, then the solution is just sine and cosine. However, if you put mu to be 60, then this has um, parasitary solutions as well. Here, the uh, uh, error propagation to e to the power of uh, 60t. So there's an error propagation of 10 to the 27 over the whole interval from 0 to 1. And even if you if you uh, compute with uh, everything exact to 16 decimals, um, you can solve the problem. So we had some noise here, and you see what happens. This, these are the noisy data. If you enter p equal 1 as a reasonable initial guess, you don't get very far, you run into a numerical singularity. If you choose p exact uh, up to 16 decimals, you get as far as here. And then it explodes. <clears throat> However, if you do uh, multiple shooting, this looks, this is the initial trajectory, which doesn't look so good, but you do get convergence after only four iterations, and practically always and always full step. So, it's a, it doesn't look good, but it is a perfect initial guess. Okay, so here's an, an, another industry application. The enzyme reaction kinetics for Candida Antarctica, a process, a, a, pro, a program, project together with Degusa. So enzymes are biocatalysts used in industry. You find them in detergents and uh, for various uh, uh, applications. And what people would like to know is their stability behavior, like um, the half-life and the total turnover. 
And you do have three types of uh, enzymes, the native enzyme, then it unfolds, and both can also deactivate. And the unfolding of the native enzyme uh, is also a reversible reaction. So what you get then is some mass action kinetics ODE for the three substances of three species, uh, very nonlinear because of the temperature uh, dependence of the reaction kinetics, uh, which is of Arrhenius type. And uh, you have eight unknown reaction rates to it, estimated from which you can then derive these stability quantities, total turnover and half-life. But, and that's the problem, there's only one control function that you can choose for your experiments and to get the data, which is the temperature profile. And the only thing you can measure is none of these three species. All you can measure is the amount of acid that is produced as a side reaction because there is a little control thing there that adds base to neutralize the acid production. And that's all you can measure. So, <clears throat> and what we will see is that the problem is very ill-conditioned and we cannot estimate parameter from a single industry standard problem. So what you see here is, this is the temperature profile for classical temperature profile for the industry standard experiment. And we can even fit our parameters to the data, to the measurements, right? And you get this, and the fit looks relatively okay. So question is, can we trust the parameters? <clears throat> and uh, probably you guess the answer is no, you cannot. Uh, so, but before we can actually say that, we have to assess the statistical error of this parameter estimate. So, but that's a, it's a relatively simple procedure. So the conclusion is a good fit is not sufficient. What you need is some analysis, and that's standard uh, statistical analysis here. Um, so the problem is, even if you have small errors in the measurements and assume that they're really normally distributed there, uh, epsilon, the measurement error, will be normally distributed, zero mean, beta, beta square as a common variance. But then, up to first order, the parameter estimate that you get is also <coughs> normally distributed, up to first order. But the distribution, well, in this picture here, it looks nice, but small errors in the measurements may produce very large error in the parameter estimates. And this map here, from there to there, is described by this generalized inverse. That's why I wanted to mention this. And this generalized inverse just then <coughs> enters the a computation of the covariance matrix, which is um, the uh, linear system. So you have j of x plus on the left side, j of x plus on the right side, and this in the middle is of course the covariance of your measurement errors. So that's how you compute the covariance matrix, and nice, even in the constraint least squares case, and the nice feature is that um, if you take just the, the square root of the diagonal elements of the C, these are the so-called standard errors. Okay. Now, that, so there's nothing spectacular here. This is well known, maybe except for the case that, is, that it is constrained least squares. <clears throat> okay, now here we have this example. So we look at the values of the parameters and their standard variation for this fit. And you, what you see is, well, the blue ones kind of look okay. These ones you wouldn't trust ever. But since all the parameters are not independent, but they're all related, so one parameter wrong, the other parameters are also wrong. So, <clears throat> what we can conclude from this here is only these parameter estimates are totally useless. That's a, a message that usually I have to people that just know experiments but not know the mathematics behind it. They don't believe it. They think the better looking the fit is, the hope for a global minimum where the residual is almost zero, doesn't mean anything. 
doesn't mean anything. The analysis of, of this dependence is what matters. <clears throat> okay. Right, so we come to stage B. I always ask my students whether they want a break, and they always say no. So now, as I said, we have fits that even look good, but the analysis tells us we don't have anything. We can't do anything with the parameters, so in our case we still believe the model. That's a separate item. Uh, come up, the, the, but I, I'm not talking about this today, how to design experiments to distinguish between different candidates of models, which is also an important issue. Here I just ask the question is how can we improve further <coughs> experiments, optimize experiments in order to get better data. Okay, so this is another application here. Um, the urethane. That was a very important problem for it's CSF. Cool. It's cool or what? <clears throat> this is um, the urethane reaction. So A, which is isocyanate, uh, plus B, which is butanol, react to urethane, C, and uh, isocyanate plus urethane further re reacts to elephantate, elephantate and um, uh, 3A, so iocyanate as such, also reacts to isocyanate. And everything in some solvent. And um, so this A, isocyanate, comes into the reactor, I'm sorry, I always think I, uh, from this feed flow, and here we have another feed flow which is butanol, which adds the butanol. Okay, and what we want to have is uh, urethane. And this is a differential equation system that you get, which is a differential algebraic equation. Um, down here you see the temperature dependence um, of the reaction. This is out of the famous Arrhenius kinetic. By the way, Arrhenius was a um, um, Swedish scientist, lived uh, at the second half of the 19th century and already predicted the greenhouse effect that is now so much debated in, in, our, uh, in the world. Okay, so this, this is the urethane reaction, and um, so the model is relatively simple, it's just six state variables for the six chemical species that we have. Again, this uh, Arrhenius kinetics that I mentioned, again, eight unknown parameters to be estimated. And VSF choose this as a benchmark problem to see whether we can actually get it better or not. You will see this in a, uh, in a few minutes. What you can choose is the sampling design. So you have a choice between three measurement methods that have all uh, different accuracy. So you can measure A, you can measure C and D as an analysis instrument, and you can measure E. And you can choose the measurement times, but that's a mixed integer problem, so it's an integer optimization problem to, to measure or not to measure. And you can choose here uh, more experimental conditions. You have three control functions that you can use, so you see that this will end up to be an optimal control problem. So you can choose the temperature profile, you can choose the amount of the feed stream number one, and of the feed stream number two. And uh, there are also six control parameters, which are the initial molar numbers of the species in the vessel and the volume of the vessel. So the, the reaction volume. But we do also have safety requirements, uh, which are on the, so several constraints, I should say. One is a safety requirement, that goes along with um, the working hours. So there is no analysis outside the period between 8 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the afternoon because then the facility is closed for um, security reason. And also trade union requirement is <clears throat> no measurements during lunch break. I mean, it's serious. I mean, this is a real problem, right? It's an industrial industry problem. 
Right? It cannot just prove existence of the optimal solution, but it has to, has to um, agree with the trade union restrictions if I design an experiment. And of course there are cost limits. And there are also limits on how, um, how many of such analyses for these measurement methods you can do per time unit, because they, they take some time. <coughs> okay, so um, now we come to the optimal experiment design. The theory of optimal experiment design is actually very old. It is, um, was developed already in the uh, 50s and 60s by uh, Kiefer and Wolfowitz. Later, uh, Norman Draper uh, was in the 80s, um, Puckelsheim in the 90s, but this is all for linear systems, not, not linear differential equations, linear equations as models. <coughs> um, but this, this here is, uh, our work on this is, one, is really uh, one of the first um, uh, parameters in uh, optimal experimental design uh, research on uh, differential equations. So, you choose the optimal experimental conditions, control functions, parameters, and the sampling design, namely which measurement device and measurement times you to use. And the cost function is you want to maximize information gain. Now, since people publish these standard errors usually as uh, their result, we choose to minimize the uncertainty of the parameter estimate and maybe you are not really interested in the parameters, the natu natural parameters of your differential e equations, but rather the performance of the model in a different, for a different <coughs> scenario. As your key issue, you want to minimize um, the prediction error of the model. That is another um, possibility. So, what you minimize may be a function of your identified systems subject to numerous state control and parameter constraints, including, for instance, the domain of model validity. Like if you have a model for a Newtonian fluid, you don't want to drive the experiment into a region where the, where the fluid cannot be Newtonian, and you don't <clears throat> Just as an example. Okay, now, that ends up to be minimizing a function of the covariance matrix, and typically one uses a weighted trace of the um, weighted trace of the um, covariance matrix subject to our discretized model equations, state and control constraints. And I just put it here in such general form. So what we do have here is it is a nonlinear mixed integer optimal control problem. It is which is non-trivial as such. Uh, we have to know that the cost function is actually an implicitly defined um, as by the generalized inverse and it is not only just implicitly defined but the covariance matrix already depends on first derivatives of your system. So it, it is complicated for the optimization methods you need higher order derivatives. <coughs> and of course we have to base our optimization procedure on parameters that we do not know. So we're, that's a German expression, I think we have to pull ourselves out of the swamp by our own hair. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> is that also a Russian expression? Yes. Yes. Similar. 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 Yes. Yeah. But funny enough, unlike the swamp situation, this really works. Okay, so there are lots of, I won't go into any details here, I just want to describe this, this um, area of optimization with differential equations because of its importance in practice. So structure, structure exploitation for the optimization method, there had to be a lot of work done. Um, evaluation of the higher order derivatives, not trivial, uh, how to solve the integer. Uh, problem um, robustification against the fact that the parameters you base this on are not known or not well known. Uh, Reoptimization, making use of any measurement that comes in to reoptimize your experiment and the like. So, 
Uh, what it ends up is uh, what we call a sequential parallel design approach. So you come up with the first guess for the parameters. Based on these parameters, you design um, one or more new experiments. And robustification means um, you are looking for a worst case solution for a certain range of these parameters possible, for instance. Um, so then you realize these experiments, get new data, improve your parameter estimation, and then loop again. And you can do that, that's a sequential approach, but partially maybe in parallel because you maybe you want to design more than one experiment in parallel. I'm, I'm very sorry for interrupting. Uh, um, yeah. I don't know, is our main goal to estimate shadow parameters and uh, we are trying to design experiment only for that or it's more complicated? We're trying to choose the right uh, experimental conditions for, uh, for estimate shadow parameters. Or yeah, for the estimation of parameters. Okay, so our main goal is to estimate parameters. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Or to um, estimate key performance indicators, as what is called key performance estimator. Uh -huh. So the accuracy of the model under certain conditions. Okay. To for, like the for prediction for, property. Yeah, for further optimization. Yeah, because I'm I'm testing the model in an experiment, mm -hmm. but maybe I'm using the model for the optimal operation of a, of a plant or whatever, and I want the optimal operation of the plant to be exact not just the experiment. I mean, I don't... It's nice, I want to reproduce the experiment very well, but maybe I have something different in mind. So it's maybe not the experiment itself that I'm really interested in, but in the use of a resulting calibrated model with a model with small errors in a different situation. Thanks. Okay. So the question is, so what can we expect? And I hope these videos work. So this is a simple SCARA robot. SCARA robots move their arms just in the, the plane. The arm is moved in the plane, but it can be lowered and lifted by the, by the uh, base uh, engine. So, and we just want to, that's just a, um, a, an example for demonstration purposes that um, the Ekaterina Kostya in her research group came up with, and I think I like it very much. So one of the problems is that the, the dynamic parameters like the inertia of an arm are relatively hard to directly estimate. Um, and the question is <coughs> to do that. Uh, also in a robot, the kinematic parameters are very often not really known. So there's a, each robot has a relatively high reputation accuracy. We have an expert in our group here who knows that. But from one robot to another, it may really differ. It may also differ from the blueprint after which the robot is constructed, and it may differ from day to day. And it even may differ depending on the temperature, of course. Anyway, here, um, here you see the simplest case. We just assume, and we just we, th we assume that the two the upper arm and lower arm are actually um, um, homogeneous, and um, so we just want to identify two inertial parameters. The simplest case we can imagine for such a robot. And can you start this again by clicking? Try to start this one. Ah, okay. So that's that was one possible experiment. Doesn't look looks okay in, in a way. And here this is the optimized version with the same time. All we can measure is the position of the tool center point. So this experiment doesn't look much more like giving us much more information than the left one. However, if you look at what happens if you add this one here to the third, the measurements of this one, to the measurements of this one, you increase the parameter accuracy by a factor of 10, which means that the right experiment has the same amount of information as if you take the first experiment and repeat it a hundred times. 
So the amount of information of the right experiment is a hundred times as much as the amount of information for the first time, for the first experiment. <coughs> so there is indeed extremely high optimization potential. Normally when we optimize an optimal control, we're happy if we say 5% or 10%, 10% 10 usually is a very large number, um, depending on, so we would normally expect so much, but you will see in, in, these, in these examples that um, savings up to 90% are uh, feasible and not unlikely with optimum experimental design. So, and this is one of the examples here um, that was important to uh, BSF, a competition between mathematical optimization, a blind test, and the head of the uh, main la laboratory of BSF, so with a real expert in experiments for the urethane, urethane reaction. Uh, I don't know what the main lab looks now, but 130 years ago um, it looked like this. Um, probably doesn't look so much different today. Um, so, um, for us this competition, and you will see why, was very important because um, we come up with a method that tries to prove that we can do better experiment, mathematics can do better experiment than even the most experienced experimenter in the lab. And so you really have to prove it. And in addition, in order to get acceptance. And in addition to that, we made this, the uh, head of the lab our partner in the game. He was always also on the publication list. So that was only formally a competition um, just to find out what the best way would be. So the expert design is not unusual. So um, we have the problem that we have to identify the temperature dependence um, because that's the most nonlinear part of the system. And uh, so he designed 15 experiments uh, a different constant, different constant temperatures, um, and all in all uh, came up with um, so with six measurements each, so all in all 90 measurements. And the result of the parameter errors you see here, so one of them is still more than 30 percent. Others looked okay, but this one here disturbs it all. Now, with the new optimal experimental design methods and a sequential approach, we did two consecutive experiments, but both experiments had a varying temperature, which is not something that you would come up with by just experience. All in all, we only just did 32 measurements, and all parameter errors were below 1%. <coughs> because it it was the time required for first and second um, 80 hours. Well, for, well. Yeah, for the for each experiment uh, it took 80 hours. So, a little more than three days. Which which is why I said it's important to actually take into account the shifts. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, no, so, such experiments very often take a very long time. So that's the that's the reaction. So what happened was, as a result, uh, well, that's just the conclusion. The costs were reduced um, to about uh, well, to about one third, from ninety such analyses to thirty two, uh, and in euros that was. 2,000 rather than 6,000 euros, but it also would take a lot of, uh, less time uh, because we just had to do two experiments and not 15. Um, so we save, and BSF then said we save up to 80% cost with these methods and get much more precise results. The interesting thing is it was legalized, so the um, 
Official, it was officially documented this report in the Bild Zeitung. That's the German Yellow Press. Somebody knows Bild Zeitung. Yeah. It's the cheapest, uh, um, in, in more than one way, newspaper that you daily newspaper that you get. <coughs> Real yellow, yellow press, and they said um, the but with uh, big, big circulation. Yes, <laughs> this is the highest circulation highest in Germany. Germany. Yes. Um, but this was actually official statement of BASF approved by their legal department that they would save um, uh, up to 80% time and they would save time and money. <coughs> and there is a, also a success story following this. BASF actually took that as a reason to fund a research group at IWR as part of my research group of four full-time scientists over seven years in order to develop these methods further. So, and I'm, I'm sure that they saved more money than this actually cost them. Okay, so I'm just saying this has really had some impact on industry. Today it's in routine application at BSF and very often used in the department of catalysts and uh, and that's the next application, optimum experiment design of a catalytic flow reactor. So the problem is you have a flow reactor uh, with silver as catalyst on such aluminum pellets, but the pellets have different shapes. And what they wanted to know at BSF was in particular, so the aim is to maximize, the ultimate aim is to maximize the selectivity of this production process. This picture here is not really what the process is, it's more what they call a symb symbolic picture, a picture uh, the conversion of ethane to ethene, to ethene to ethene oxide is not an in really industrially very relevant problem. But the, the real oxidation process was confidential, so I cannot talk about it. Um, so, and the important decision criterion was now to get the, to know the heat transfer coefficients inside the flow reactor. Here is a picture of the flow reactor. Um, because these, the, the heat conductivity and the heat capacity are important to avoid hot spots, so the lifetime of the reactor is very much influenced by a good heat conductivity. <coughs> and you only have, for the experiment, uh, we only have, so there are four parameters to estimate in that reactor, and for the experiment we only have two controls, namely the boundary temperature and the mass current density, so the density of the flow, in a way, and all we can measure is the temperature at the out outlet. <coughs> so the boundary temperature is the heating of the process, of course. Now it's a 2D non-stationary partial differential equation, um, and the, the intuitive, rec so the expert design before was they would do four experiments uh, that um, took 16 hours um, and uh, they would use constant current dens density but they would make use of the non-stationary heating because they thought that was really what was all about from 20 centigrades to 350 centigrades and the optimum experimental design turned out just one experiment of two and a half hours, varying the current density, but stationary heating at maximum temperature. So quite the, uh, the opposite of, of what they thought would be. So that reduced, of course, the, the time and the cost by 80%, so one day um, instead of three days per uh, pellet candidate. And um, the different the results were different with high accuracy, and the effect was that they were actually deciding for a different catalyst, or so a different say, different pellet shape, which made a whole difference of one million euros. And I'm just saying that because you know the savings of the experiment is only eighty percent, but it made a difference for the whole company of one million more than one million euro that they were saving by building the reactor in a different fashion. So, and this is the last example here from the um, experimental design section. 
So designing one experiment at a time often cannot solve the problem, so you need design parallel experiments, and we see this here for the enzyme reaction problem that I still owe you. That was the original um, measurement from the initial profile, and then we designed five extra experiments in parallel and got all the parameters in a relatively uh, a good, with relatively good accuracy, and we even see that these two parameters were actually already relatively good and rather independent of the others. But we didn't know that before, of course. <clears throat> so, but the interesting thing is the solution. You remember, we could only optimize the, uh, the temperature profiles. And this is the solution. This is the industry standard temperature profile. And these are the five experimental profiles. Hmm. So, why is that optimal? <clears throat> and can one actually learn, say with machine learning, learn how to do optimum experiments? And I, I say no. There is, because if you ask yourself what is different here, is that in this certain way, the measurement information you get is actually orthogonal of the five experiments. And these temperature profiles here have certain orthogonality, say. So each of these experiments contributes something else. But why this is optimal is not easy to explain. I have never tried. So the complementarity is really the, the problem <coughs> And um, Igusa was really so happy about it that they actually filed a European patent um, uh, on doing experiments in a parallel fashion for enzyme uh, parameter estimation. So, okay, that's the section number two, and I think I still have a few more minutes. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And I do have uh, two more examples in optimal control. Um, and they're not the same as on uh, Wednesday. <laughs> um, so the first is optimal control of robots. Um, so the first question, and this is, um, this is an old example, but I like it still very much. Um, namely, to find out what the physical potential actually is to accelerate motion by optimization. So, we have, this is just a ex computer experiment. This is a so-called polar coordinate robot. So, it can rotate the basis. It can move up and down this arm here. And there is a motor inside this cube, so it can shift the arm through there. And what we want to do hmm? okay. what we want to do is um, simplify things. So we forbid the up and down motion. So we just consider motion in the plane and we ask ourselves just simply we want to move the arm in. Here is the load. We want to move the arm in to a certain distance. If there was a stick here, I would try to show it to you. <laughs> so, seen from above, it looks like this. So, the red position is the initial position, and we move it into the uh, blue position. And what is the time optimal motion? So, you can accelerate, you can decelerate. Um, so, what's the guess? What do you think? If you have, if you can accelerate this arm, wanted to move from A to B, how do you do optimal control when you want to go from A to B? Minimum, mean minimum time. Assume you are going with a bicycle and there is a straight line and it's just 100 meters and you want to go from A to B because there's your girlfriend over there and you want to get there in minimum time. How would you bicycle. ride your bicycle? 
I know what you would do, in particular if there's your girlfriend there after 100 meters. You would accelerate as fast as you can and as much as you can and then you would break full, full stop following the famous bang bang principle, right? That's what you would do. <clears throat> Except for the robot, that's wrong. That's not the time optimal mode. So, so the idea would be so accelerate in that direction and as as much as you can and decelerate as much as you can. Right? So first maximum acceleration, then maximum deceleration or breaking. And do not rotate the arm. Of course you can rotate the arm, but you are not required to rotate the arm. So but so that's the classical decoupling approach. Every motor does what is necessary, and only what is necessary. So also the same approach in a, in a research group um, or in an office. Everybody just does the design task. Okay, now <clears throat> this would be <clears throat> my fault. So that, that would be the solution as we discussed it, but it is not the solution. Um, this is the solution. Can you click on this one, please? This is the solution. So the rotational motor does have to do a job. And what, what is the job? Uh, so we save 22% as seen from above. So why is this the optimal solution calculated? Because the rotation motor actually helps the in and out motor. It produces a centrifugal force that helps the in and out motor to break. To go over there. Yeah. And so, this is a slightly exaggerated, so there is this wiggle, we call it the wiggle maneuver. So, the time optimal solution is, has a wiggle. The rotational motor produces a centrifugal force that helps the in and out motor to break. And if you analyze that mathematically, we can actually prove that this is necessary uh, by combining the maximum principle and the so-called general hoops, I'm sorry, and the so-called generalized Legendre Cliff condition for singular arcs, <coughs> and uh, and it just reads like this: that's a generalized Legendre Cliff condition, and what it means is the solution is bang bang in the sense that there is always one engine. It's a time optimal problem, linear um, uh, linear controls. So one of the controls is at the boundaries, always, maybe more, but at least one. And we can consider that as the weakest link or the performance limit. And you can see here, like the in and out motor is always at the boundary, but the others must not idle, so they cannot be singular if they can produce a force that would help the, the weakest link. So that's what we call the cooperation paradigm. So all the motors that are there um, need to help the um, bang bang uh, engines, uh, bang bang motors, by producing corresponding forces if they can. So centrifugal force, as in this example, we constructed also an example where Coriolis force, which normally is not very big, uh, would help. There's always gravity that can be used in order to gain momentum or even to or to break. So that's that's another way that needs to be used. And then there is a famous increase or decrease of inertia, the period effect. Like if I uh, this is the wrong um, carpet here. Uh, one cannot uh, we have dances among us, right? So if you turn your way around then if you stretch your arm in a period, you break the rotational, you uh, decelerate the rotational maneuver. If you uh, get your arm close, you accelerate. <coughs> and, uh, and these are typical examples. Uh, so on the left one would be a trivial approach. Again, every motor in, on the, in the left um, maneuver uh, only does what is necessary. They all just change 
from the initial angle that they are controlling to the final angle, and then it looks like this. <coughs> and the optimal solution looks totally different. And what you see here in the optimal solution, a serious reduction of the inertia for the base rotation, so that the base rotation becomes uh, much uh, faster here, <coughs> and you also see gravity um, actually helping uh, the arm breaking at the end. So uh, this is just one of many such examples, and I, I wanted to keep in time, so um, that is um, this example. So what we con can conclude from this is that the optimal solutions for such articulated uh, multi-body systems to find an optimal solution is very difficult, but there may be very difficult maneuvers. Um, but mathematical optimal control methods can actually find these solutions. And uh, we've applied this together with uh, my friend Georgi Kostin from the Institute of Problems of Me Mechanics um, of the Academy of Science uh, to a time critical transport maneuver. This is a so called press connection. So that's the trunk of a previous model. That's not a video. So it really it won't move anywhere. <laughs> so there is, this is the trunk of a um, Mercedes Benz um, E type van. And it goes through 11 such presses in order to be formed. And uh, and you can, and if you ask yourself what is the tact rate, there is one maneuver that determines the tact rate because it's the slowest maneuver. And there's a maneuver that uh, does only take, uh, that only takes the, 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 the hood from one, uh, from one press to the next. And the slow, one is the slowest maneuver. And the, the people that um, gave, that Adana gave us this as, as an example, <clears throat> because they had tried to manually uh, tune this already for half a year and then we did an optimization of this procedure and the result was what, so what, what was wanted was a fast automatic generation of a collision free minimum time path subject to uh, state and control constraints of course and we could accelerate in this uh, study here the um, um, this bottom bottleneck maneuver by nine percent, so that increased the tact rate or the productivity of the of that line by ten percent. Okay, so um, and this is the final example, and then I'm done. Um, so collision avoidance in air traffic control. This is a very recent uh, project of my colleague Ekaterina Kostina at Heidelberg, um, and that is. Um, optimal control for collision avoidance. Um, air traffic control is, as we all know, is ever increasing. Germany has like 8,000 flights per day and it still um, increases. And then there is, well, unfortunately, that is my fault. It should have been animated and I did it wrong. So, <clears throat> but all the air traffic control is done manually by human air traffic controllers in the towers, uh, like everywhere else. And we are looking for ways to increase safety, of course, collision avoidance, to increase also air capacity, also to reduce the, the amount of, unfortunately, that's what would, um, they, they want to do, reduce the amount of human labor uh, involved. And uh, if possible, also reduce fuel consumption. Uh, and now, the fuel consumption is really significant. So you use 450, uh, 450 billion tons per year uh, just for civil aviation in all over the world per year. Billion tons. And I've just and I looked up at the table. What is the Consumption from Madrid to Berlin, six tons, and it should be approximately the same distance, I think, from, as from Frankfurt to Moscow. Six tons of kerosene, just to carry 250 people. 
Um, so, um, so what we what the question is what would be needed is sophisticated, sophisticated automated tools to at least assist this human air traffic controller um, and to increase safety in the capacity and eventually also reduce the fuel. And um, so this, this is a study to analyze the potential, not to replace the human controller, but to see whether that is actually possible. So we, what she done, did was solving the optimal control problem for <coughs> one flight sector, so the space up there is divided into sectors, and the air traffic controller is responsible for one sector and knows when an airplane is entering and also where it is supposed to leave the sector. And now the question is of possible collisions there for the controller. So it's an optimal control problem to reroute if there are more than is more than one aircraft in one such flight sector, but to minimize the deviation from the nominal track in order to waste fuel and to guarantee state constraints, namely a minimum distance of uh, airplanes from each other of uh, five nautical miles. Five nautical miles. <coughs> and, uh, and to compare that with the human solution. And here are two examples. So this is uh, four aircrafts. I just gave, uh, took two examples. Um, and they would, the, the air traffic controller judged this as being difficult 4.3 on a 1 to 5 scale. That was the human solution. This is the optimal solution uh, for the same situation. The human solution uh, has uh, uh, 28 extra nautical miles to be f flown. The optimal control um, was asking for four extra miles and no delay here and uh, 250 seconds, so four minutes delay in the first case. So the, se and the second example, these were four aircrafts, B737, for the fuel data. And um, <clears throat> that was even considered to be more difficult. This was the human solution with a five minutes delay and 30 uh, extra miles. And the optimal control, no delay at all, and nine extra miles. And also, of course, looks nicer, but that is the nature of optimal control solutions, very often at least. Okay, so there is a very high potential of optimal control methods to actually improve um, air traffic management. Um, we have considerable reductions in delays and track deviations, and what is more important is, and these solution procedures are actually even today real-time feasible. So that could be done in real time, and that would be maybe one step towards what they call free flight. So real, fully optimal, full optimal control for all airplanes, um, not not any more done by human controllers, just as a supervisor. Um, and the, but it's really then automatically done with an added benefit of about five percent fuel reduction compared to the manual solution. And, um, well, I, had, I do have a forward look here. But let, let me say these two slides. So, what I say is problem and process complexity and also the expectation to what mathematical methods should do are constantly growing, in particular in industry. So, the complexity is we have to come up with multi-scale, multi-physics, High dimension, non stationary instead of stationary, non linear, non smooth, even uh, uncertain, taking into account uncertainties. And we do have to develop these mathematical methods. So we all have work to do in our research um, because we don't have them yet. <clears throat> so if we really want in industry to replace trial and error by direct model based optimization of processes or products or plants, then we have to come up with new methods. Well, we, we can do discrete, we can do continuous, we can do dynamic, we can deterministic, the stochastic, but we can do all together. So we have to integrate the various approaches um, in, in order to be able to solve the problems as they really are, because they usually all of all of this. 
<coughs> so there's also work to do. And then industry um, advocates the so-called, what they call, digital twin paradigm, which is nothing but mathematical models that are developed with a product or with a process from the beginning and is accompanying the process, permanently adapted to the measurements that we have and to be used then for uh, monitoring, fault detection, maintenance, planning and so on. Um, but we're not yet there yet. I mean, that's what they are advocating. And it's a, it's a chance for mathematicians. But there are also emerging application areas, not just in industry, where we actually do, can do something to improve situation on Earth, medicine, mathematical MSO for diagnosis and therapy, energy conservation in traffic in buildings, optimization of heterogeneous energy networks, conflict management in transportation, like in air traffic management, but also in the future, autonomous systems. MSO for environmental projects, so um, problems. So there's a lot of, lot of areas in which mathematics and optimization haven't uh, really um, been applied much. So I'd say that the century of mathematics as a technology has only just started. Okay, thank you.